Okay, good. Jake, thanks a lot for having me in this today. When I was writing and researching the book, the museum was a huge help. So to be able to do something like this back for the museum, that means a lot to me, so thanks. Um, George and Elizabeth Spangler hosted between 2,500 and 3,000 wounded men on the two hospitals on their farm. That's more than the entire 2,400 population of Gettysburg at the time. So I'm going to spend at least 90% of this talk on the medicine, on the surgeons, on the wounded, on the nurses, everything that went on at least two hospitals on their property. But before I do, I wanna give you just a brief overview of what was going on around them while they're working and trying to save lives. All of this was going on around them. So let's take a look at the map on the left first. You can see the Army of the Potomac line and you see George Spangler's farm marked in gray. It's huge and it dominates the countryside behind the line at 166 acres. It's close to the line, it's close to the left flank, it's close to the center and it's close to the right flank. This was a farm that could hold lots of artillery and infantry in reserve. Then there are the roads. Granite Schoolhouse Lane is marked by the Blue Arrow, cutting through the heart of the Spangler's farm. Then you've got Blacksmith Shop Road cutting through their farm, marked by the Blue X's. And note how it not only goes right to the battlefield, it goes right to the round tops. Army of the Potomac commanders had the size, the location, and the roads needed to get reserves to the line quickly and often just in time with this farm. This was a farm that could help win a battle. This map shows how the Army of the Potomac used the Spangler's farm and what was surrounding the two hospitals. Number 10 on the map is the site of the 11th Corps Hospital. That's around the Spangler's barn, house, and other outbuildings. Number four, is the 1st Division 2nd Corps Hospital up at Granite Schoolhouse, almost in the middle of Spangerland. Number nine marks the uh, Army of the Potomac Artillery Reserve. Now men from the 9th Massachusetts Battery of that reserve went into the Spangler's barn before the battle on July 2nd because they wanted to look at the Confederate wounded who were in there. Now, if you were a doctor or a nurse and you could have taken just a quick 10 minute break between uh, three o'clock and seven o'clock on July 2nd and walked out into the middle of Spangler land, you could have done a 60 to 360 degree turn and you would have witnessed frantic, loud masses of men, horses just everywhere rushing past you. Now, most followers of Gettysburg know very well the story of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain and the 20th Maine and other fifth corps regiments that famously rushed to a little round top and got there just in time to defend it on July 2nd. But what they might not know is that Chamberlain and the rest of the fifth corps got to little round top so quickly because they spent the afternoon of July 2nd resting on and next to the Spangler's farm as shown on the right of this map. So later in the afternoon on the 2nd, the fifth corps gets its orders, get to the front. So part of the corps rushes down Granite Schoolhouse Lane makes a left turn at about where number six is on the map, heads straight to round, Little Round Top. The rest of the Corps heads down Blacksmith Shop Road. They're not got, gone long before the sixth Corps moves into that very same location. And they're not there long before they're ordered down Granite Schoolhouse Lane to the front. Later on the night of July 2nd, a division of the 12th Corps has moved off Culp's Hill up on the top of the map. They rush down Granite Schoolhouse Lane to the front. General George Meade had his main street and its name was Granite Schoolhouse Lane. Now, accompanying the 11th Corps Hospital were 100 ambulances. And you can see where they were parked on the Spangler's uh, two wheat fields. The artillery reserve brought the ammunition train with it. This is 100 wagons and hundreds of mules and hundreds of men. And they're supplying the artillery for every artillery battery in the Army of of the Potomac. So when they arrived at Spangler on July 2nd, they had 24,000 rounds. When they left a day later on the 3rd, they only had 4,000 rounds left. You have artillery and infantry bivouacs on the left side of the map on the farm. And then you have Powers Hill. 
Uh, two thirds of Powers Hill is owned by the Spanglers and the other third is owned by the Lightners. General Slocum sets up his 12th Corps headquarters on top at the bottom of the hill and he's there for five days. Then you have General Meade. He's bombed out of the Leicester House on July 3rd. So he retreats to Powers Hill and he watches the rest of the battle from the top. When the battle ends, he returns to the line. And when his work is done on the line, he returns to Spangler and he sets up his headquarters where it's shown on the map. There's a grove of trees there right now. There is no marker for his headquarters, but uh, it's next to the General Henry Slocum marker right along the Baltimore Pike. And also on Powers Hill is a signal station with its wags flaving, waving. This photo shows one artillery battery. There were 19 artillery reserve light batteries in the fields next to the 11th Corps Hospital on Spangler land on July 2nd. Now each of the seven Union Infantry Corps at Gettysburg had its own artillery batteries, totaling about 200 cannons among the seven corps. These cannons were there, went where their assigned corps went. The artillery reserve though added 106 cannons, 2,300 men and 2,300 horses. And that's a whole lot more power. But the best thing is, is the artillery reserve cannons based at Spangler on July 2nd and 3rd don't have to go with any infantry corps. These guys were the crucial utility players that could be plugged in anywhere on the line if they were needed. And that's exactly what Meade and artillery chief Hunt did on the last two days of the battle. They rushed cannons from Spangler to the line, often with only moments to spare to save the Army of the Potomac line from crumbling and prevent the Confederates from breaking through. These guys rushed from Spangler, out by the Peach Orchard, on the Wheatfield Road, on the Trosso Farm, on the Plum Run Line, on the Kadori Farm. They fought all along Cemetery Ridge. They fought on Cemetery Hill. They fought on East Cemetery Hill. They even fought on the Spangler's own Powers Hill. Other farms saw a lot more combat than the George Spangler Farm in the Battle of Gettysburg. Other farms were destroyed by some of the worst fighting ever seen in this nation, but no single farm played a greater strategic and logistical role with its two roads with Powers Hill and its middle of it all location for both the artillery and the infantry than the George Spangler Farm in setting up the Army of the Potomac victory. And all of this happened around two hospitals on the Spangler's land. And before we move on to those hospitals, all of you probably know this photo of all these dead horses covering the land on the Trosso farm. Well, those are artillery reserve horses. And two hours before they were killed at Trosso, they were at Spangler. That was their headquarters. Now the hospitals. The first division caught the heaviest of the blow. Many killed and wounded were the result. And the latter were now being brought to the hospital in great numbers. Granite Schoolhouse surgeon in charge, Dr. William Warren Potter, 57th New York. A Granite Schoolhouse was built in the early 1860s when the Spanglers donated the land for it. On days two and three of the battle, there was a major first division, second Corps Army of the Potomac Hospital in the fields and woods around this school. This hospital has received little attention since the battle and little has been revealed about it until my book came out last year. And I, <laughs> I just think that's a shame. There's not even a sign for it. Like there are for so many other division hospitals around Gettysburg. It's just overgrown unmarked land with thorns and poison ivy that make it difficult to enter as shown in the bottom left photo. But this hospital hosted the first division second Corps wounded and dying men who fought at Rosewoods and the wheat field, two of the most well-known places on the battlefield. Where did these famous, famous fighters go when they were done, when they were wounded? They went to, to Spangler, the Granite Schoolhouse. These were the men of the famous Fighting Irish Brigade. This was the division of the Reverend Father William Corby, who granted the men general absolution, clearing their path to heaven. This was the Corps of Major General Winfield Scott Hancock. More than 1,000 men of the 1st Division were casualties on just that one day of fighting. And by the end of July 2nd, most of those wounded were either at the 1st Division 2nd Corps Hospital at Granite Schoolhouse on the George Spangler Farm 
or they were waiting to be taken there. Chaplain John Henry Wilbrand Stuckenberg of Erie in the 145th Pennsylvania served at the Granite Schoolhouse. He said, our hospital was at the foot of Powers Hill. I found the doctors and nurses busily engaged with the wounded scattered around in all directions. Some lying on blankets, some on straw, a few on stretchers, others on bare ground. Private Erastus Allen of Company G shot through the abdomen and suffered terribly. Some of the intestines protruded through the wound and some of their contents would occasionally flow out, producing a horrible stench. It was very evident that our regiment had again suffered severely. If possible, it was preferred that men be placed in the correct divisional hospital. So during the evening of July 2nd, Chaplain Stuckenberg walked a quarter mile from Granite Schoolhouse to the 11th Corps Hospital at the Spangler's Barn and found several men from the 145th Pennsylvania who had been taken to the wrong hospital in the heat of battle. Those who could be moved were taken to the 1st Division 2nd Corps Hospital at Granite Schoolhouse. Normally this wasn't practical though and the men just stayed where they were. For well, example, the 11th Corps had 20 wounded. For example, the 11th Corps had 26 regiments at Gettysburg, but the 11th Corps Hospital had wounded men for more than twice that number of regiments and batteries. Chaplain Stuckenberg became known worldwide as a biblical scholar and lecturer after the war, and he left his papers and part of his estate at Pennsylvania College, which became Gettysburg College in 1921. His wife, Mary G Gingrich Stuckenberg, was a leader also at the college and did much work there, and they are both buried in Sol Soldiers National Cemetery in Gettysburg. Father Corby didn't mention the Granite Schoolhouse in his memoirs, but as chaplain of the Irish Brigade, that is where he would have been assigned and he undoubtedly did much important work there. Second Corps Ambulance Chief, Lieutenant Thomas Livermore made numerous deliveries to Granite Schoolhouse on July 2nd. He said here under the shoulder of some, the shelter of some boulders lay a large number of our wounded and dead who had been brought from the field. They lay upon the ground covered with their blankets and the living were nearly all silent, having fallen asleep from fatigue. Lieutenant Livermore was in charge of more than 100 Second Corps ambulances. And amazingly, after two days of intense Second Corps fighting, only three were destroyed at Gettysburg. Brigadier General Samuel K. Zook, treated at the school on July 2nd for a massive chest wound before dying in a house farther behind the line on July 3rd. His wound opened such a gaping hole that a doctor could see the general's heart beating. A monument at the wheat field shown at the top left of this page marks where General Zook was mortally wounded. Colonel Edward Cross, 5th New Hampshire, died July 2nd at Granite Schoolhouse after being mortally wounded on the opposite side of the wheat field from General Zook. Cross Avenue between Devil's Den and the Wheatfield bears his name today. Colonel Cross was beloved as a great fighter in New Hampshire and by many of his men, but he was despised by others for his drinking and tantrums. His unit's Pioneer Corps called him a tyrant and they refused to bury him. This monument in the middle of the page is to Colonel Cross and his fighters. Lieutenant George A. Woodruff, 1st United States Artillery Battery I, was mortally wounded on July 3rd during Pickett's charge when he was hit in the back while facing and directing his men at Ziegler's Grove. The son of a Michigan judge died at Granite Schoolhouse telling his friends that he regretted being shot in the back and asking that it be no reflection upon his reputation. Most of the 1st Division 2nd Corps Hospital at Granite Schoolhouse was moved to safety farther behind the line on day three after 24 hours of intense service because it was getting hit by Confederate artillery overshots from the pre pickets charge cannonade. In fact, every major Union hospital directly behind the line was moved farther away during the battle except the 11th Corps Hospital in the Spangler's buildings, even though it was under fire too. The school was torn down in 1921 
and nothing remains of it today except the foundation of the building, which is buried under decades of growth. This fallen tree accidentally marks the location of the school. The open fields where the wounded and dying men of the Wheatfield Plight lay next to the school are now covered in woods and overgrowth. Gettysburg is dotted with markers at hospital sites, and my hope is that someday the National Park Service does the same for Granite Schoolhouse. At the very, very minimum, we need a sign there. We need a mark. I would guess most people, Adams County residents drive right by the site and have no idea where, where the school stood, this important school, an important hospital. So we need a sign. And the National Park Service ideally should come in and clean out all those trees that weren't there in 1863 when that was a hospital. One day cured me of a hospital. Give me the picket line every time in place of a hospital. Captain Matthew B. Cheney, 154th New York, after visiting the 11th Corps Hospital at the Spangler's Farm. The 11th Corps medical staffers picked the Spangler's Farm for a hospital on July 1st because of its proximity to the evolving front line and access to water plus crops and livestock for food, buildings for hospital purposes, good roads, and wood for operating tables, fires, and caskets. While the 1st Division 2nd Corps Hospital used the school on Spangler land, the 11th Corps Hospital used the Spangler's barn, summer kitchen, house, outbuildings, and fields. Most hospitals at Gettysburg were division hospitals, like the one at Granite Schoolhouse, serving only one of three divisions in the Corps, but the hospital in and around the Spangler's building served all three divisions and was the hospital for the entire 11th Corps. George Spangler was 47 years old during the battle. The wife Elizabeth was 44. Their children, all of whom were living in home, at home in 1863, were 21-year-old Harriet, 19-year-old Sabina, 17-year-old Daniel, and 14-year-old Benaya. The six Spanglers were ordered by 11th Corps doctors on July 1st to either leave their farm or stay together out of the way in one upstairs bedroom. So that bedroom is where they lived during the five weeks and two days that their home was occupied for a hospital. Widower, widower neighbor Jacob Hummelbaugh spent time with the Spanglers during the battle because his farm was used as a hospital and was in danger right behind the line. So that put seven people in that one bedroom at times. They could leave the room, but in doing so, they had to step over and around wounded and dying Union officers just to get out of their house. The farm of Spangler's neighbor and Nathaniel Leitner also was used as a hospital and the Leitners left because the smells in their house made them sick. The ambulance corps started delivering 11th Corps and other wounded to the farm at about 4 p.m. on July 1st. At its peak on July 4th and 5th, the Christian and Sanitary Commissions estimated that there were about 1,900 wounded at this hospital. Of those 1,900, about 50 to 100 were Confederates. The hospital's attendance peaked on, on the 4th and 5th because ambulances could then safely search the town and surrounding areas for wounded men who were left behind after the Confederates pulled back and left. Army of the Potomac ambulances were far, far too superior to those of the Confederacy which often refitted farm, grocery, and army wagons into, into ambulances. But the Union ambulances at Gettysburg and under medical director, Dr. Jonathan Letterman's guidance were state of the art. Each two horse ambulance was a stout spring wagon with two seats, entirely stuffed and covered with leather. The wounded men could sit in these ambulances or the wagons could be set up to carry three men lying lengthwise. There was a keg with fresh water and a faucet, and there was beef stock and bandages and other medical supplies. There were springs slash shock absorbers on Army of the Potomac ambulances to reduce the bouncing and agony of the wounded men. And some men were given morphine for the ride to the hospital to further ease their discomfort. These ambulances had retractable curtains on the sides, and many had, had a built-in canvas at the top that could be pulled out and around the wagon and be attached to the ground, forming a tent for nighttime. There also were four horse ambulances at Gettysburg, but two horse ambulances were the most used. 
Each two horse ambulance had a driver and two stretcher bearers. And they drilled on such matters as the proper method of picking up a stretcher, walking with it and placing it in and taking it out of ambulances without further wounding the wounded. This wasn't given much attention before Dr. Letterman was placed in charge on July 4th, 1862. Letter's attention to, to detail was such that the front stretcher bearer would step off with the left foot and the rear man with the right. Before Letterman, civilians, untrained soldiers, teenage musicians, and basically whoever was available manned the ambulances. And these men and boys often refused to go into danger zones for they fled from the first sign of a fight, thus stranding the wounded sometimes for days. Letterman implemented a trained professional corps manned by soldiers who were selected for their character, courage, and intelligence, and who could be counted on to perform well under fire. And those chosen would remain with their regiment, so they would be aiding their friends. This was one of the most efficient ambulance systems in the history of war until this time. Second Corps Ambulance Chief Captain Thomas Livermore, who I mentioned earlier, said in addition to his 100 ambulance, he had almost 400 men and 300 horses at Gettysburg. The 11th Corps also had 100 ambulances and they were mainly at Spangler and East Cemetery Hill until scouring the town on the 4th and the 5th. George Spangler said, the Teamsters parked their wagons in the wheat fields, principally ambulance wagons. One field of 10 acres was nearly white with wagons and those ambulances kept the Spangler Hospital crowded and busy. Dr. Daniel G. Britton of Westchester, Pennsylvania said the wounded soon began to pour in, giving us such sufficient occupation that from the 1st of July to the afternoon of the 5th, I was not absent from the hospital more than once and then but for an hour or two. Very hard work it was too and little sleep fell to our share. Four operating tables were going night and day. Many of them were hurt in the most shocking manner by shells. My experience at Chancellorsville was nothing compared to this, and I never wished to see such another sight. For myself, I think I never was more exhausted. A Spangler surgeon who was approaching total, approaching total exhaustion called the work too much for human endurance. Triage took place in and near the Spangler's barnyard, shown partially at right. Those vertical posts in the photo, by the way, weren't there in 1863. They were added by the Gettysburg Foundation in recent years. Civil War surgeons didn't know how to save the men with serious head, chest, and abdomen wounds. So they were given morphine and set out of the way someplace to die. Men with lighter wounds were also put aside for later or sent back to their regiment. Those who could be saved with surgery or amputation were given top priority and placed near the operating tables to wait their turn. The Civil War was the first time triage was used in the United States. Surgeries and amputations took place here under the forebay of the Spangler's Barn, which, which is that seven foot overhang shown here. There doctors could work with their backs to the wall and have more light and fresh air away from the smells and away from the crowds inside the barn. A surgeon could finish an amputation in five to 15 minutes, depending on the limb, using a kit like the one shown at the top left, and then move immediately to the next one. They had to move quickly because of the flood of wounded and because the death rate doubled when an amputation was delayed more than 48 hours after the soldier was wounded due to the development of blood poisoning, bone infection, or gangrene. This happened frequently at Spangler because of the backlog of soldiers awaiting surgery and the fact that some were left untreated behind Confederate lines before they could be recovered. Many men died because they didn't arrive at Spangler until the fourth or the fifth. No washing required of bloody or germ infested hands or bloody equipment after surgery. Sometimes a Spangler surgeon with germ covered hands would put his hands in a soldier and infect that soldier with a disease. Also, germs and filth were carried from their body or clothing into the wound by a bullet or an artillery fragment. Doctors introduced germs by probing a wound with an unsanitized finger. And at Spangler, amputations took place 
next to the barnyard and stable and their manure piles. Private William Southerton, age 19, 75th Ohio, says, at the doorway I saw a huge stack of amputated arms and legs, a stack as high as my head, the most horrible thing I ever saw in my life. I wish I had never seen it. I sickened. Amputated limbs were loaded into a wagon or wheelbarrow and buried somewhere on the Spangler's property. The amputations and surgeries and wounds attracted an infestation of flies that relentlessly harassed everyone. Pigeons in the barn added to the filth and hornets added to the pain. Then there were the maggots that covered wounds and stumps. By the way, you had a greater than 90% chance of survival in the Civil War after a finger, hand, foot, toe, and uh, of an amputation of a finger, hand, foot, toe, or at the elbow and, and wrist. You only had a 42% chance of survival after an amputation at the knee joint and a 27% chance of survival at the hip. Infections were expected after a Civil War surgery, and the worst infections could be smelled eight to 10 feet away. So imagine the stench that greeted a hospital staffer or visitor in the barn, or when entering a tent filled with eight to 10 men all suffering from infections. To help battle these smells, Spangler Hospital workers cut branches off pine trees and hung them on the tents, and they even used them for bedding. There were a few antiseptics and disinfectants available during the Civil War, but the understanding of them was not good, especially early on. Then, Antiseptics were usually used to treat an infection after it was well along, instead of cleaning the wound with it to prevent an infection. Infection rates dropped later in the war and after the war's end, as antiseptics and disinfectants became better understood. This is George and Elizabeth's Pennsylvania bank barn, which they built about 1852 after they bought the property in 1848. The design is classic Pennsylvania bank barn with the four bay in the front that we've already talked about and the bank in the back where the farmer could drive his wagon to the top floor for loading and unloading of crops. I think these uh, bank barns are beautiful. I think they're works of art. I think they're highly functional. And because they were brought over by the Swiss and the Germans into what is now, what was then heavily German, Adams County, you can see these barns all over the battlefield. You can see them across Pennsylvania into Ohio some and into Maryland some, but I think they would be a great barn for all across the country. Um, but men were crammed so closely together in the Spangler's barn that it caused the spread of diseases. Some men died of the diseases rather than the battle wound that brought them to the hospital. All of this hospital was horrific. All of this barn was horrific, but it was the worst under the forebay where the amputations took place and just inside that front wall in the stable where many of the worst cases awaited their surgery amid cries of agony and smells of infection, body fluids, and human feces. Cries and screams could be heard 50 yards away in the family's house. Hospital workers covered their head with a pillow at night to try to drown out the sounds. Nurses read scripture and prayed with the men in, in an attempt to help send them on their way. Outside in the Spangler fields, the army didn't provide enough tents or bedding or food or clothes for the first several days, multiplying the misery of the wounded and dying men who were forced to lie in the mud in the open when the thunderstorms came. Army of the Potomac Medical Inspector, Dr. G.K. Johnston said of the wounded on July 4th and 5th, some were under such shelter as a farmer would be ashamed to show for his cows. It sometimes appeared as if an experiment had been made to see how many wounded could be crowded into a given space in a house. And then there's Corporal William R. Kiefer, Spangler hospital worker from the 153rd Pennsylvania. He said, hundreds were lying with but feeble or in most cases with no shelter, exposed to a cold incessant rain against the sides of the barn and in an orchard adjoining the sheds. Their moans were heard in every direction. And with a lantern, I moved about from one to another during the long hours of the night. I searched in vain for blankets to cover the suffering and the dying.
Two female nurses played key roles at Spangler. Marilla Hovey and her 17-year-old son, Frank, traveled with her husband, Dr. Bleeker Lansing Hovey of the 136th New York. And she was always one of the first ones to reach the hospital during a battle, arriving at Spangler on July 1st. Normally, nurses weren't, most nurses weren't even allowed in until after the battle. But Mrs. Hovey got there on the first day because she was with her husband. Unfortunately, no photos of Mrs. Hovey are known to exist today. The Hoveys are the only surgeon's family known to have traveled together during the Civil War. Mrs. Hovey and Frank were there during the battles and each grueling march in between. They experienced every hardship of the soldiers, including sometimes scarce and inedible food, going to a, the bathroom over a hole in the ground in the open, masses of lice, searing heat and humidity, freezing cold, and gruesome hospital scenes. Mrs. Hovey had been her husband's nurse in private practice for 20 years prior to the war, and Dr. Hovey relied on her. Mrs. Hovey nursed the wounded and wrote home to family members of the dead and dying. She was able to go into some sort of an autopilot mode and look past their terrible wounds and suffering and hold the hands of the dying soldiers and talk and listen to them in an attempt to get their mind off their agony and situation as they cried out for their mother or father or wife at home. In one letter from Spangler, Mrs. Hovey informed a family of their son's death and told them, I have had a good deal of care of him and called him my soldier boy and tried to take the place of mother, sister, and friend. I think I never had such a trial parting with one that I had no more acquaintance with. The Hoveys worked at the 11th Corps Hospital the entire five weeks it was open. Then they went home to New York for three weeks to recover. Nurse Rebecca Lane Penny Packer Price of Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, rode to Gettysburg on a bench in a railroad car in the middle of the night with donations shortly after the battle. Then she went right to work as an unpaid nurse at Spangler. She said, the sad scenes would fill a volume. So many times at night, I lay on my stretcher, weeping instead of sleeping. Captain Augustus Vignos of the 107th Ohio was wounded on July 1st on what is now Barlow Knoll. Gangrene developed and his right arm was amputated above the elbow at Spangler. Mrs. Price nursed him from near death until he was well enough to take a train home to Canton. He went on to marry in 1866, have nine children and a mass substantial wealth as a businessman. He was even a pallbearer at the funeral of his close friend, President William McKinley. Vignos carried Mrs. Price's photo for 40 years after the war. He even showed her photo to fellow ex-soldiers at national encampments in an attempt to find her and thank her, but he never had luck. Finally, in 1906, he received a letter. Dear sir, do you remember the tall nurse at Gettysburg who furnished you with clothing so that you could go home? She had found him. Vignos replied that he looked forward to seeing her with great pleasure. And their Spangler reunion took place at a GAR encampment in the state of New York in 1906, 43 years after they met at the Spangler's farm. I know of 10 women at Spangler who left their personal lives behind to help heal the wounded. But I'm betting there were at least twice that number or more. Many were Mrs. Price's friends from Phoenixville. They tended the men, prayed with the men, tried to keep up with the flood of hospital linens that needed to be washed in a cauldron in the Spangler's yard and set up and ran the cooking tent. These volunteer caring women probably saved countless lives and sometimes were the perfect medicine for these soldiers even just by sitting and talking with them and maybe holding their hand. State of New York relief agent, Dr. Theodore Diamond said of the Spangler Hospital, several good women were encamped here, cooking for and nursing the wounded. Shirts and, shirts and sheets were provided when needed. Food of good kind and variety and well-prepared was furnished. Local Gettysburg women also were regulars at the farm. Mrs. Price said, how gladly we welcomed the farmers and others who came with their wagons filled with supplies. Sometimes the ladies brought food already prepared. Private James R. Middlebrook, a hospital worker from the 17th Connecticut, 
said citizens from other places are doing all they can to comfort the wounded and may God bless them. There are a number of ladies here every day and one who belonged to some regiment who wears the soldier's uniform throughout. One lady was here with the American costume on yesterday. And finally, Private Henry D. Locke, 157th New York, who was at Spangler with a foot wound. He said, the ladies bring us provisions of all kinds. They seem to be very kind to us and well they might. The Army of the Potomac just wasn't prepared for the aftermath of a battle the size of Gettysburg. It didn't have enough of anything for Spangler and other hospitals and men were dying as a result. Into the void stepped the Christian Commission and the Sanitary Commission. They collected donations from across the North and provided food, clothing, hospital supplies, bedding, soap, and towels. The Sanitary Commission said it distributed more than 100 wagons of supplies in Gettysburg by July 7th, only four days after the battle's end with five more railroad cars on the way. The Sanitary Commission was so advanced and organized that it delivered perishables to Gettysburg in railroad cars packed with ice. Spangler Hospital worker James Middlebrook said, the members of the Christian Commission are here from Philadelphia and Baltimore and citizens from other places doing all they can to comfort the wounded and may God bless them. Without any doubt whatsoever, the medical recovery from the Battle of Gettysburg was powered in very large part by the private sector. This is my wife, Barb. We spent a week up at Cornell University a few years ago when I was researching and getting ready to write. And we went through 19 of these boxes looking for information on the 154th New York because they had doctors and staff and many patients at the Spangler Hospital. Uh, this collection was so filthy that after we were done with it after a week, uh, the school closed it down and declared it hazardous materials. But we are so grateful that we went because not only did I get a lot of information on the 154th that proved mighty useful, but those guys were there at Spangler when Armistead arrived. So after the war, they talked about it and they wrote about it and they did interviews about it. And so I actually got some new materials after all these years because we went through those 19 filthy, dirty boxes, I got some new materials about Armistead at Spangler. So let's look at that. Confederate Brigadier General Lewis Addison Armistead began the final walk of his life in what would become known as Pickett's Charge on the Seminary Ridge Farm of Henry Spangler. He would die two days later on the farm of Henry's half brother, George Spangler. Armistead arrived at George and Elizabeth's farm at dusk on July 3rd, according to Dr. Henry Van Arnhem of the 154th New York. Armistead arrived in an ambulance. He was removed on a stretcher and placed on the ground next to the ambulance near the Spangler's barn. The 11th Corps Hospital Workers Private Every Emery Sweetland and Private Edson Ames of the 154th New York described Armistead's appearance as pretty bloody and covered with blood. Sweetland heard Armistead as he lay on the stretcher say, you have a man here that is not afraid to die. The Spangler's property was a shoulder to shoulder mass of crippled bodies, confusion and agony when Armistead arrived. Wounded from Pickett's charge were pouring in as overwhelmed surgeons desperately performed triage and tried to find who could be saved with immediate attention. Even so, the arrival of the Confederate general turned heads. Hospital staffers and wounded were drawn to him and a large crowd of workers and gawkers formed around his stretcher and they circled Armistead. The crowd was finally broken up when Dr. Van Arnhem of the 154th arrived at Armistead's side and ordered that he be carried away for treatment. Fellow Spangler patient, First Lieutenant T.C. Holland of the 28th Virginia said he and Armistead were placed in the orchard. Lieutenant Holland said at one point under the trees that Armistead asked the doctors and nurses working around him to, please don't step so close to me. Dr. Van Arnhem described Armistead as wild, nervous, flighty, saying war must cease, men of same blood, and he could not live. Spangler patient Just, Private Justice Silliman of the 17th Connecticut described the 46-year-old Armistead as rather past middle-aged. 
Private Sweetland said Armistead had gray hair and whiskers. Dr. J. Kling of the 55th Ohio said Armistead was suffering intense pain induced by the wound. Stimulants and painkillers were immediately given him. Dr. Britton took time to get to know Armistead, calling him a fine man, intelligent and refined. I had considerable conversation with him and was much pleased with his manners and language. Armistead died July 5th in the summer kitchen, a separate building shown here to the right of the Spangler's house. Army of the Potomac Captain Frederick Stowe, the son of nationally known author Harriet, Harriet Beecher Stowe of Uncle Tom's Cabin fame, was his roommate in the building, which was reserved for VIPs. Stowe, however, lived. Armistead was wrapped in a blanket and placed in a coffin made of wood from the Spangler's farm and he was buried in their orchard. One month later, he was exhumed by an embalmer seeking to make money off his body. So Armistead was dug up after a month in a wood coffin. His body was embalmed in whatever condition it was in, and then it was reburied. Then his body was dug up one more time in October when relatives claimed it and they had him reburied in Baltimore. I found, confirmed, and listed the names, wound, and treatment of 1,436 Union and Confederate men at the Spangler 11 Corps Hospital, and the names of almost 140 men who were buried in the Spangler's peach and apple orchards. The Union men were exhumed within a few months after the battle and reburied in Soldiers National Cemetery in Gettysburg. Most Confederates, other than Armistead, lay in Gettysburg until 1872, when they were exhumed and reburied across the South. Armistead is one of five Confederates known to have been buried at Spangler. Fifty-year-old Colonel Eliakim Sherrill of the 126th New York died in the Spangler's house. His funeral in Geneva drew lines of people that stretched several blocks. His image is on the monument to the 126th New York in Ziegler's Grove. Assistant Surgeon William S. Moore of the 61st Ohio was mortally wounded while working at an aid station close to the line on July 3rd on the Tawny Town Road, and he died July 6th at Spangler. Amazingly, he was the only Army of the Potomac surgeon or assistant surgeon to die at Gettysburg. He left behind one-year-old and two-year-old children, and young widow Sarah was so torn by grief that she mourned for the rest of her life and she never remarried. Colonel Francis Mahler of the 75th Pennsylvania died at Spangler. The Philadelphia City Council honored Mahler with a resolution and they paid for his funeral. Mahler's brother, Second Lieutenant, Second Lieutenant Lewis Mahler, died on the battlefield on July 1st at about the time and place of his brother's mortal wounding. <clears throat> Sergeant Nelson W. Jones, Third Maine, Third Corps, died at Spangler after being hit in both legs by an artillery shell in the peach orchard. He died even though he made and applied tourniquets to himself on the battlefield. Sergeant Jones was 20 or 21 years old. Private George Nixon of the 73rd Ohio died at Spangler. He would be the great grandfather of President Richard M. Nixon. George Nixon was 40 years old when he entered the army as a poor man working on a farm that he rented he left behind a wife and nine children when he went off to war, probably only enlisting to make money to support his family. And you can tell from his eyes in, the, in his enlistment photo how sad he is to be going off. Adjutant and First Lieutenant Joseph Heaney, age 21, 157th New York, died of a leg wound at Spangler. Nurse Price walked next to his stretcher and held an umbrella over him to protect him from the July sun as he was being taken to the Spangler barn for an amputation. First Lieutenant Thomas Wheeler, 75th Ohio, age 25, spent almost a month at Spangler before he died of four wounds. His parents were at his side in his tent and Nurse Price sang Rock of Ages to him as he died. Many soldiers didn't tell the truth about the seriousness of their wounds in their, in their letters home from Spangler because they didn't want their family to worry. Sergeant Henry Sees of the 82nd Ohio 
wrote to his brother. My leg was amputated just above the knee. I stood the operation very well, being under the influence of chloroform. I am very well cared for and in a fair way to get along well. I hope mother will not worry herself about me. Sergeant C's died a week after writing that letter. Many died at the 11th Corps Hospital who were the lone source of income for their sickly parents back home. Many died at Spangler's teenagers. 19-year-old drummer Thaddeus Reynolds of the 154th New York was in such agony from lockjaw as he neared death that doctors decided to put him under with chloroform just so he could die in peace. Lockjaw is known today as tetanus and is prevented by vaccination, but in the Civil War, only about one in 10 survived it. Corporal Andrew Mayberry of the 20th Maine 5th Corps died at Spangler, leaving behind wife Hannah and five children ages six months to 11 years. One father arrived at Spangler one day after his son died. One wife arrived a few days after her husband's death. They both found, found out about their loved one's death when they arrived in Gettysburg. Happily though, the vast, major, vast majority of 11th Corps hospital patients survived. They included Captain Alfred E. Lee, 82nd Ohio. He went home from Spangler with a hip wound and he discovered his obituary in the newspaper. After seeing that, he further surprised his hometown residents and family members when he walked in on his funeral. Brigadier General Francis Barlow spent a week at Spangler with three wounds that numerous doctors declared to be mortal, but he surprised all of them and lived. It's thought that his wife, Arabella, attended him at Spangler. And I think I actually have a, a photo of Arabella now. I'm not gonna use it today, I'm 99% sure, but if I can get to 99.5 for sure, I'm gonna really, Start blasting that photo of Ella, Arabella Barlow around. Corporal James Bar Brownlee of the 134th New York survived seven gunshot wounds at the brickyard on July 1st, one of which broke four ribs. Three of those seven wounds were in his bowels. Private Justice Silliman of the 17th Connecticut was knocked out by a shot to the head on July 1st. He was taken to three different Confederate hospitals in Gettysburg before arriving at Spangler on July 4th. He healed and became a nurse at both Spangler and Camp Letterman. He said of the scene at Spangler, the barn more resembled a butcher shop than any other institution. One citizen ongoing near it fainted away and had to be carried off. The surgeons at Spangler were among the best of the best for their time and they saved far more lives than they lost. And just like the soldiers, these surgeons were taken prisoner, they were wounded, they got sick and they suffered. Many Spangler surgeons died in their 30s and 40s because of their exposure to diseases, horrifying work, poor food, long marches, and unsanitary camp life. I dug up in my book research the names of 15 head surgeons who worked at the 11th Corps Hospital. And most of them went on to leadership roles in medicine and their community after the war. These men are three of my many favorites. Dr. Henry Van Arnhem of the 154th New York was performing an amputation outside the Spangler barn as Confederate cannons opened from Seminary Ridge during the pre pickets charge cannonade. He stopped as shells exploded near the barn saying, boys, we may as well suspend. The decisive moment has come. So Van Arnhem and other medical staff took refuge along the back wall of the Spangler's barn next to the underground root cellar. Dr. Van Arnhem was a passionate opponent of slavery who wanted full civil rights for blacks. He said, the curse of God visits on all that come in contact with this atrocious institution. Dr. Van Arnhem served four terms as a United States Congressman. Dr. Henry K. Neff of the 153rd Pennsylvania was suffering on the Spangler property just like many of his patients. Neff became ill with pneumonia at about the time of the Battle of Chancellorsville and while seriously ill was captured and taken to Libby prison in Richmond where his health further deteriorated during four weeks of captivity. At Spangler, he had quote, much suffering, cough, pain, pain with sense of stricture through the lungs, difficulty of breathing, emaciation, 
loss of appetite and general debility. He died not long after the war at age 45. Finally, Spangler surgeon, Dr. Jay Kling of the 55th Ohio. He was captured by Confederate cavalry while on his way home after being mustered out in Georgia in 1864, and he was imprisoned for three months. He filed a claim to the government for losses sustained and expenses incurred, but was denied because he was taken prisoner after he was mustered out. Almost to a man, Spangler Farm 11th Corps surgeons were described as distinguished, prominent, beloved, and leaders. <clears throat> Army of the Potomac Med Medical Director, Dr. Jonathan Letterman said of the surgeons at Gettysburg, these officers were engaged assiduously day and night with little rest in attendance upon the wounded. The labor performed by these officers was immense. Some of them fainted from exhaustion induced by overexertion and others became ill from the same cause. Skill and devotion shown by the medical officers of this army were worthy of all commendation. They could not be surpassed. Dr. Letterman also deserves commendation for so many men surviving their wounds at Gettysburg. Not only did he design the efficient ambulance system, but he also set up the division hospital format that put the best surgeons at the operating tables. He ordered that the soldiers take a bath once a week after he took command and twice a week later in the war. And he even had to tell them to put on clean underwear once a week. He improved diets and included more fruits and vegetables. He introduced more rest and exercise in the army and ordered that the men be drilled no more than twice a day. He ordered that long deep latrines known as sinks be dug and he insisted that the men use them instead of going anywhere they pleased. He also instructed that refuse be buried and wells be dug and he showed the army how to pick drier, better ground for hospitals and camps and how to use pine branches as bedding to get soldiers off the bare ground. These basic improvements decreased such diseases as scurvy, malaria, typhoid fever, diarrhea, and dysentery. Dr. Letterman was honored and thanked for his important service with burial in Arlington National Cemetery. Water dressing was a treatment of choice at Spangler and other Civil War hospitals, as shown on this partial list from my book. Water dressing simply meant applying an ointment to a wound and keeping it covered with a wet cloth. It was usually the job of a wounded soldier who was well enough to take care of others or soldiers pulled from the ranks to work in hospitals to change water dressings regularly. The cloths would be clean in between use, but not sanitized. This slow moving stream on the very south end of the Spangler's farm was a source of water for dressing, as was the Spangler's well next to their summer kitchen and the nearby Rock Creek. There was plenty of water for thousands for hospitals in Gettysburg because of heavy June and early July rains, but not all of it was clean because many streams and wells were contaminated by dead men, dead horses, and animal waste. This little unnamed stream produced something else to the Spangler Hospital, leeches. Hospital workers collected leeches from slow streams, but especially ponds, to put on wounded men to reduce inflammation and reestablish blood flow, among other things. Bloodletting also was studied at Spangler. Also, it's believed the Spangler doctors were beginning to understand how maggots were beneficial because they ate dead tissue and left healthy tissue alone, lust feeding a patient's healing. More than 80% of the Army of the Potomac's 600 plus surgeons left Gettysburg with the Army on July 5th, leaving only a few behind because they were expecting, expecting another battle any day south of the Mason-Dixon line. Spangler surgeon, Dr. Daniel Britton of Westchester wrote home to his mother saying, I confess it was with a feeling of intense relief that I got my orders to leave this place where groans and cries had been resounding in my ears for days. Wounded men who could be moved began to trickle out of Spangler on July 6th. A few local farmers are known to have used their wagons to carry wounded men 10 miles to a Littlestown train station. Private Reuben Ruck of the 153rd Pennsylvania took all day to limp from Spangler to Littlestown with wounds in each leg. 
The train station reopened on July 7th after railroad bridges damaged by the Confederates were repaired, prompting a mass exodus of wounded from town. 20,000 wounded from both armies were left behind and 11,000 of them had left Gettysburg by July 14th, going to towns with bigger, cleaner hospitals, such as York, Baltimore, Harrisburg, Philadelphia, and New York. But the fact that these wounded could travel didn't mean they were healed, as many from both sides died in other hospitals after their transfer. There were 3,000 or 4,000 wounded in town in late July, with most of them at the newly opened Camp Letterman on the outskirts of Gettysburg. Second Corps nurse Emily Bliss Souter wrote home on July 27th. The 12th Corps is entirely removed. The 11th Corps nearly so. The ambulances and litters are constantly passing through town. This morning, the poor wearied ho horses attached to the ambulance refused to carry their burden up Cemetery Hill. Fr Private Franz Benza of the 26th Wisconsin was one of the last wounded men to be taken from the 11th Corps Hospital when he was transferred to Letterman on August 6th, but he died on August 28th. With the railroad into Gettysburg now open, family members came from all over to collect the dead, including two brothers-in-law from Ohio, of Ohio assistant, of assistant surgeon William S. Moore, who as I said earlier, died at Spangler. They carried him home in a sealed casket. Now this practice of taking the bodies of blood ones home for burial, was banned by the government later in July, and most of the remaining dead were eventually buried in Soldiers National Cemetery. Wounded continued to be sent away until finally on August 7th, the Spanglers got their farm back after the closing of the 11th Corps Hospital, at least what was left of their farm, but they had survived. George filed three damage claims to the state and federal governments totaling about $5,000, but they received only $90. And it's believed that the entire $90 went to their Washington DC attorney. So they got nothing. In reply, the US quartermaster's agent said, the government of the United States is no more responsible for bringing on the battle fought there. And it would have been had a tornado passed over that country causing as widespread destruction as did that terrible engagement. That battle and hospital damage was his misfortune. This often used uh, photo at the top of the page is one of only two known photos of members of the George Spangler immediate family. And this one is of their youngest son, Benaya, his wife, Sarah, and daughter, Mary Elizabeth. It was probably taken in 1888 for the 25th anniversary of the battle. Benaya and his, his family were living on and running the farm at this point after his after his parents had purchased another farm, smaller farm next door and moved there. This photo shows how well the Spanglers rebuilt their farm after the battle. If you look on the left side of the porch, they added everything on the house. Everything to the left side of the porch was added after the battle. You can see their smokehouse where they cured and preserved their meats on the left side of the house. You can see their outhouse behind the picket fence. You can see the summer kitchen with its grape arbor on the front of the summer kitchen where they not only grew their grapes, uh, but they used it for shade. They sat under the arbor and, and did some chores in the shade. The photo up bottom right is from 1886 or 1887 is in front of Granite Schoolhouse and includes four members of George's family. This is uh, where Mary Elizabeth attended school on her grandfather's farm. Mary Elizabeth is marked by the blue X, if you can see it maybe. And Benaya is under the blue circle, looking like he just walked off the set of the Fiddler on the Roof movie. He's in the photo because he was on the township school board. Clara Patterson is marked by the blue triangle and Alice Patterson by the blue arrow. They are the daughters of George and Elizabeth Spangler's second child, Sabina Patterson. Teacher Maggie Swartz is on the right, looking like she's holding a ruler. And in the front with the dog, that's little Raphael Sherpy from the Peach Orchard family. Sadly, by the time this photo had been taken, Raphael's father had already died. But instead of that, despite that, uh, Raphael grew up to become a prominent citizen and a dentist. 
George Spangler was chairman of the Cumberland Township School Board when he donated the land for Cumberland for the Granite Schoolhouse on his property in 1861. He also was a church in Adams County leader, serving on several boards, including the Evergreen Cemetery Board when it voted not to allow Confederate burials there. A teacher whom George hired said, Mr. Spangler proved himself to be a very efficient school official and made a lasting impression on my mind as a man of truthfulness and honesty in all things. Elizabeth took care of her widow or father in his later years and made sure he was buried next to her and George. The Spanglers also took in a niece after George's sister Susanna died. Spangler children Harriet and Sabina married local farmers and had families. Daniel moved to Kansas to use his carpentry skills in the growing new state and he settled near Abilene around the time Wild Bill Hickok served as marshal there in the early 1870s. Benaya worked the family farm for many years until he gave up farming and moved into Gettysburg. As was common in families in those days, personal tragedy followed the Spanglers. George's daughter Harriet died two months after he died. Then Harriet's daughter Annie died a few days after her mother. So Elizabeth lost her husband, a daughter, and a granddaughter in a little over two months. One of Daniel's two sons drowned at age 15 in Kansas and Benaiah's only grandchild died as a toddler. After an almost complete rebuild, since purchasing the property in 2008, the Gettysburg Foundation now opens the farm to visitors and offers programs and tours on weekends in June, July, and August. It's important to note that if you visit the farm, that most of the wood in that rebuilt barn was there in 1863, and is the same wood that the men lay on and next to. Some of that barn's wood even dates to the 1700s from a log cabin barn that was on the property. And when the Spanglers told, tore the log cabin barn down, they recycled some of that wood into this barn. And finally, if a sadder task can be found on this earth than that of searching through field hospitals after a great battle, I know not what it is. Captain James F. Huntington, Army of the Potomac Artillery Reserve. And make up your mind to travel some when we get home. Spangler Hospital Steward James R. Middlebrook of the 17th Connecticut wrote in a letter to his wife, Frances, on July 12, 1865, shortly before he was mustered out at Hilton Head. I think of going to that place long to be remembered, Gettysburg. Thank you so much for your time and attention and hanging in there with me today. Uh, I appreciate you listening to the Spangler story. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ron. That was uh, incredible. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more uh, at the uh, at the conclusion of our, our day-long program today uh, about some exciting partnerships that are uh, in development with the Spangler Farm and the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, the Gettysburg Foundation. Um, talk a little bit more about them. But uh, thank you so much, Ron, for being here. Um, Want to open up for anybody uh, with questions. Um, feel free to, uh, to, to speak <clears throat> up and uh, ask away. Um, also can use the comment section as well, which is already bringing <clears throat> some, some um, comments here. Tanya saying uh, incredible presentations. Thank you so much. And, and Tom, uh, fantastic. Thank you. Um, so feel free to uh, Ask any questions of, of, uh, of Ron. I have a question. Hey, go ahead. Um, can he talk more about, uh, he said the government banned families come in to bring um, the bodies home of the soldiers? Right, I don't have a lot of details about that. Only it was middle to late July for some reason. They wanted the remainder of the bodies kept in town so they could be buried. Uh, they were thinking they were gonna, you know, organize a cemetery in town somewhere. And, you know, that also what also might have been a problem is there were so many families coming in that, that, that could again have been a congestion and getting in the way type problem. So there were probably a couple of reasons that they banned that. 
I, I absolutely, I, I got your book um, as soon as it came out because I well, love the you. story of, of the families and, and you hear so much about the common soldiers, but how much it affected the families and your information uh, toward the end about the, the barn and its reconstruction was just fabulous. And, and now oh, when I go you. to visit, it just enhances the visit. So thank you so much. Yeah. So you said you have been there? Uh, many times, yeah. Okay, good. And it's like a new discovery. Yeah, did you get there this year after they redid the house? They added on to the house too. Yeah, no, a, just the last time I was there just for another tour, but it was previous. So now I'll have to go back again. So yeah, it's all yeah. so so especially when you you mentioned the just the original barn boards in that yes. and the barn just brings it all to a lie. Isn't it gorgeous? I mean it, the stable, the stable on the first floor is where the really, really in danger guys were kept. You know, they didn't know if they were going to get to save them or not. Um, so that was really horrific down there. And then you've got guys, the threshing floor upstairs, they're lying shoulder to shoulder upstairs. And that's that wood that's upstairs right now is that wood. And the blood was actually dripping down through the boards to the guys beneath them. So, the yeah. detail, how you wrote it, it, it almost felt like you were there. So oh, it was thank just, you. That's actually one of my dreams. Could, could I please go back in time and be there? Yeah, exactly. So, so thank you for, for bringing that alive. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Tell me at the time that they did the uh, rebuilding and reconstruction of the barn and area, was any, was an archeological survey done and did they find any artifacts? They they did an archeological uh, survey later on when the cemetery at the hospital was in the orchard. And when the foundation bought it, the farm, it was just a field and they wanted to put an orchard there to honor where the, where the cemetery was in the orchard. So they wanted to plant like 100 or whatever apple trees. So they did uh, ground penetrating radar out there to make sure that all of the bodies were up. And uh, they found that they were, there was nothing left out there. I think they've probably done um, some more around. And I think actually there might be more planned, but you know, even before, like even when the, this farm was in private hands, people were finding things along Blacksmith Shop Road like crazy because that was a main thoroughfare out there. Just along the side of the road, they would buy, find army equipment. So a lot has been found out there in previous years. Previous years. And, uh, I actually hope someday that we can, uh, I, I might have an idea where the limbs are buried. Oh, wow. and, <laughs> and so I'm, I'm working some angles and hoping that maybe we can get something done to maybe find them. That would be fantastic. I hope that that, that works out. And uh, if you need any help, <laughs> you can let me know. Um, the foundation is, Gettysburg Foundation has told me they're on board, but we've got to get the Park Service on board too. And you know, I don't have a lot of facts on this. I'm just going on hunches. So I don't know if I'm within a mile of them, but I have a place where I think they might be. Um, I mean, Mark, it, I, if there I are saw... some buried limbs there. That's uh, let's mark it off and honor it. Yeah. Or something. This is sacred ground. Um, I saw Mark's hand up. Uh... If you want to go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I have a, a question regarding uh, the dead bodies when when they were processing and getting them ready to be buried. Did they go through the pockets and pull out money they or did. change or photos or books? They or did. They had what they cut. Uh, Civil War hospitals had what they called a dead house, which was usually a tent where they placed these uh, these Union guys. And once they could get to them, they collected their effects for and sent them home to the families. And that's where they got them ready for burial in the dead house. Now, there's two spots where the dead house could have been at Spangler. It could have been a tent close to the orchards, or once men were starting to be shipped away on the fourth or fifth and sixth and seventh, especially, the upper floor of the barn might clear it up again. And like the North Haymow facing Gettysburg would have been a wonderful place to establish a Haymow kind of away for us, a dead house kind of away from everybody. So there were a couple, nobody wrote about where the dead house was at Spangler, but 
It was either a tent by the orchard or it was in one of the hay mows. Uh, Rick. Um, great Rick. presentation, Ron. Um, uh, and everybody on this, um, this Zoom is interested in medicine, I presume. If you don't have Ron's book, it should be the next purchase you make. It's just- Oh, thanks, Rick. I learned so much from it. Just wanted to make a couple of medical comments. Ron, you mentioned about leeches from the ponds and streams. Leeches are still used today medicinally. Isn't that something? By plastic surgeons. Uh, not only do they take <laughs> out of flap surgery, they inject a blood thinner, which helps keep the vessels alive. And the only other comment I wanted to make, I've always been struck when I read this, when you talk about maggots and how helpful they are because they debride just dead tissue. They don't eat live tissue. Yeah. The soldiers would describe the rather bothersome crunching noise they made when they yeah. would, would uh, um, chew on the dead tissue. So but just a great presentation. I've had the privilege of being there a number of times and I don't want to overstate it, but I'm telling you, when the sun's going down and you stand on the back of that barn, it's almost a spiritual experience. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a, and as horrific as a place it was, I can't even imagine how horrific it was. I get a real sense of peace when I'm there now. It's, it just, I do. And I get chills out there. It's just, yeah. imagine what happened and how peaceful it is now. And you know, you mentioned at the back of the barn, there's all those trees out there. There's all those, all those woods out behind the barn now. Now they weren't there in 1863. And I still have trouble believing this, but Two guys in the book said they could see Pickett's charge from the top of the Spangler's barn. So I don't know. They said they could. <laughs> now, just by way of a comment, I, try, I tried to use maggots once in my life in practice for some non-healing leg ulcers, and the nurses were absolutely up in arms. <laughs> when, I was an when I was an intern at Bellevue, we leave the maggots on the street people to make good rounds in the morning. Yeah. Trouble is, if you left them too long, you had a ward full of horse flies. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I'll bet with the leeches that you, modern science, they don't go down to the stream and try and find some. Yeah. <laughs> for, yeah, for, yeah. A for a time, you could get leeches from Boston or Atlanta and cute little plastic reproductions of the old leech jars. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, you know, I, I have a question uh, on that on that regard. I know it's not related. Apologies, Ron, but just on That's this, okay. where where do where do you procure uh, leeches or maggots for for medical use? They're, they come sterile. Yeah, you okay. can order. You can order. They call them medical maggots. And medical maggots. And leeches too. But you know, our, when we reenacted Spangler, one of our guys, Doug Shope, actually has leeches that we show people. And yeah. the, re the reason there's no bodies there, of course, Ron alluded to all of this, is that the women from the South came up in 1872 and got the Confederate bodies. And Samuel Weaver, who was the guy who was in charge of digging up all the bodies for the cemetery, his son was a physician. And he knew where basically where the bodies were buried. And he directed the, the women to uh, get all of the bodies out of there. I don't know if the Union guys buried at Spangler would have been in Soldiers National Cemetery yet by the time Lincoln delivered the Gettysburg Address because that was an October to March process. So did they move up in October, November or not till after the, the first of the year? But if yeah. you go like to oh, the Ohio section of the cemetery, the fourth row of it, it's like 22 out of 25 guys are from Spangler. So but I just don't know what time in the time frame they've removed. Rand will show you where George Nixon is in the cemetery there. <laughs> um, I think Ron? I saw uh, Bob. Did you did you have a, a question as well? I saw your hand up earlier. No, oh, I'm just relaxing. Okay, gotcha, <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Um, does anybody else have any any questions or comments for Ron? Ron, well, I I, I just want I, I want to second about Ron's book. You know, I I uh, Paul had asked me to give this talk about which I've given a couple times out there on medical care to battle. And when Ron's book came out, I had totally revised the talk because I learned so much more. And, and our everybody in our, our reenacting group is like must reading. You know, anybody who reenacts there, it's you've got to read Ron's book. It's fantastic. That means a lot. 
I think the, Thanks, the best Jill. thing I learned about it is the Granite Schoolhouse Lane story. Yeah. Uh, um, no, I, I knew there was a Granite Schoolhouse. Didn't know it was such an important hospital for Caldwell's division. And at least we didn't present Hancock this morning, but I think that's his first stop after he, he was there. He, he was that close to Armistead. Yeah. <laughs> we just don't know if they were there at the same time, but they were both yeah. on Spangler after the right. battle. <laughs> It, it is pretty upsetting Ron? that there is no sign there or anything to acknowledge that. And yeah. uh, th that's just so sad. It so, is. And yeah. I need to, by the end of the year, I hope that I put in a request with historic Gettysburg Adams County because they're responsible for all of the hospital signs that are around. So they're working on it with me now. Uh, the Gettysburg Civil War Roundtable is interested in working with it, me on it. Cumberland Township Historical Society wants in. So now I just need to set it up with uh, the superintendent of the park and their cultural person and say, you know, what can we do here? And if I have to raise money somehow, I mean, I'll be happy to do it because this is this is a really important place and you wouldn't know it. It's all it's all woods right now. Right. And the foundation is still there. You just have to rake the leaves in the ground, probably illegally on Park Service oh. land, but you can get down to it. Mm. Hmm. All right. Does anybody else have any any questions? Ron, uh, can you hear me? It's Paul. Hi, Paul. <laughs> hey, Ron. Uh, I had, Janice and I are here watching this, and as always, I ne I never tire of hearing the stories. But we had a question. <laughs> in all your in all your travels, and research, and you know all of that combined, is there any one thing? that really got to you or still does get to you? And again, I don't want to put you on the spot because uh, I, I know there's a lot, but there, we were just curious, is, is there any real one thing that just sticks in your mind or maybe in your heart? You're right, Paul, because there are so many things, but Mrs. Penny Packer Price wrote <laughs> so much about that hospital. And I learned so much about her and her family, that when I went and I spoke to the Phoenixville Historical Society last year, and I made my whole talk just about her, I really kind of broke down at the end because how much Mrs. Price did for the farm and how much she meant to me. So there are probably 90 to 190 stories like that, but she, she will always be up at, the, up at the top or very near the top. And you know what? She could, she could use some more play and attention out at that farm too. That, that's that's true. And you know, it, it always troubles me, or always ha I always have a problem when I'm at the farm. Or I'm talking about any of this when I start talking about the common soldiers or ordinary people, because there's nothing ordinary about any of these people, and there's nothing common about someone that's willing to volunteer to stand up and have somebody shoot at you. That's, that's not common at all. And uh, I wish we could, somebody smart like you or smarter than me, that's for sure, come up with a better phrase than ordinary citizens and common soldiers. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Um, I saw, um, I, I think we have a, another uh, comment just came in, um, but I, I know I saw Fred, um, I'm not sure where Fred went, but I saw Fred's uh, hand was uh, up. There you are. Uh, <clears throat> Ron, thank you for that great present. Sure, thank that was you. Just another place on my bucket list. It's <laughs> but I'd also like to say thank you for mentioning the uh, ambulance folks. What they did as a retired paramedic, it's always good for me to, to see um, those hardworking uh, men, um, you know, recognized for what they contributed to the effort as well. You know, and they were might have been among the most hardworking people there because after day one, after the ambulance workers were done going into danger and pulling their guys out to try to save them, oh, hey, we need you to work in the hospital overnight. So they <laughs> took two hour shifts in the hospital overnight. So they didn't get much of a break at all, those ambulance guys. Thank you. Help me, Anne's Christmas gift. And uh, we'll we'll go over to uh, to Karen. Um, this will be our our last question, so we can get ready for our next presentation. 
Karen. Fantastic. Thank you so much for, um, for answering the question. I live on the property of Catlin Farm. Um, if you're familiar with uh, Mechanicsville battles. Um, I'm actually, my question is, is it likely that a person who had not prepared themselves to become a surgeon would have been um, called a surgeon um, during the war? So, um, so basically, I haven't been able to find um, the history of my third great grandfather's um, medical experience. So I'm wondering whether he already had it or um, whether it's possible. I think you, the main way to become a surgeon, and I think people went around this and the armies went around this because they were so desperate in the Civil War, was go to school for six months, to hear lectures for six months, and then uh, go be an intern for six months or whatever, and then repeat the process the next year. <laughs> then you're done with uh, medical school. <laughs> but... but the armies each had a manual. This is how you amputate a finger. This is how you amputate a wrist. This is how you amputate at the leg. And if somebody could, if somebody really had a taste for doing that kind of, so yeah, there were a couple of different routes, even if you weren't a, a med school grad. But I mean, it, it was so hard though that I think half of the 11,000 union Fourth Virginia, and at one point that regiment had no surgeon, and their hospital sur sur steward, George Waller, actually served for several months as the surgeon of the regiment. Interesting. That that helps me to have that context. <laughs>